If you can hear this, be warned. We are not of your world. We are watching you. We are biding our time to strike. Until then, we will taunt you with scary noises. What the hell are we listening to? Scary Noises. Scary Noises, your podcast for audio horror. I am your host, Todd Merriman. With me is my co-host, Mr. Matt Clayton. Hi. What? Uh, let's take a moment and cherish this, because this is the first, the debut episode of Scary Noises. Our virgin voyage, in fact. Yes. It's kind of dead in here. We should make this more of a party. We should. Let's get an entire collection of champagne bottles and smash them against things. Just trash the studio with it? Motley crew this motel room. Let's do it. You down? Okay, we're going to take a pause to go get lots of champagne. Yeah, give us a minute. We'll be back in just a second. Okay, we're back. And, we are um, back. <laughs> we've smashed an entire case. So many things got destroyed. I don't even know how we're still recording. Um, the magic. What is the, uh, what, what are we listening to tonight? Or what's, what's the story? For our first outing into the realm of scary noises, we are presenting you the top secret dossier of Dr. Cyrus Harmon. Who? Dr. Cyrus Harmon. He is the central character of the 7th Street Haunt here in Louisville, Kentucky. Why are we presenting the story of the 7th Street Haunt? Well, because, Todd, as you know, I'm lucky enough to get used like a cheap harlot for the purposes of making sound and music for haunted houses. That, yeah, you're pretty. that's kind of why I'm using you to make this podcast. I know, right? I'm just like... You just toss it up there for anybody to come by and just... Take advantage. I'm so cheap. You are so cheap. I'm free. But I'm not even a whore. I'm a slut. Well, can I at least promise you that I will never toss you away like a used Kleenex? Okay. I mean, I'm I'm Does down that to make you feel better. I'm down to float around in the toilet bowl like a used condom if that's really how people want to treat me, but we're getting off topic. So the, the story <laughs> the story that we're presenting you tonight is about a German scientist who creates a machine that drives people crazy. That's right. And Matt did all the music. Uh, we kind of cobbled the story together. The main idea, though, came from where? It came from Travis Bowling, the owner of 7th Street Haunt. He gave us a rough outline, and we kind of took it and ran with it over a lot of beers and whiskey and cigarettes and, and made this 
sprawling creature with it. So enjoy the top secret dossier of Dr. Cyrus Harmon. If you're listening to this recording, you have received the appropriate security clearances. It is presumed you will exercise the appropriate discretion. discovered that prolonged exposure to specific frequencies can cause a psychosis which, when properly controlled, could prove significantly advantageous to Germany's war effort. Testing of the machine proved that effective use would require significant adjustment due to its adverse effects on test subjects. She looked so lifelike in the casket that she might not really be dead. In his hallucination, the subject recounted the feeling of being buried alive, screaming at the top of his lungs and beating wildly at his restraints, as if trying to escape from a casket.
the machine was especially painful for survivors of <sighs> sexual trauma. Some subjects noted a loss of all bodily control, including that of the bowels, made all the more horrifying by their hallucinations. Disappointed at the initial results of Harmon's work, Project Deus Ex Machina was officially closed down by the Reich. American spies had been sending reports of his progress, and we quickly acquired his services and had him transported under cover out of Germany and into a secret military base in the heart of Kentucky. After his arrival at the base, work resumed with Harmon giving complete autonomous control. His data described violent behavior on the part of the initial American test subjects. While the German soldiers he had experimented with all exhibited a more psychological reaction stemming from childhood trauma, the American subjects exhibited a more desperate and primeval reaction. One soldier, referred to as Danimal by his company mates, suffered extreme brain damage following his first few sessions. And after expulsion from both the installation and the military, he could sometimes be found skulking around the grounds in ripped and soiled fatigues. A small company of guards were dispatched to, as Harmer noted in his journal, quote, remove the lugubrious brute, unquote. Private Daniel W. Lazier was discovered in a makeshift shelter constructed out of various animal skins and tarps. He was found disemboweled, reportedly by his own hand, and was surrounded by what appeared to be no small amount of skinned cats, dogs, and other small woodland animals. Due to the necessary secrecy his presence in the United States required, Armin and his family were obligated to set aside a number of rooms within the installation and convert them into temporary housing for the duration of the tests, both for the project's safety and for the safety of his family. However, this precaution did not come without its own dangers. Harmon's journal entries became more erratic, several of which point to the effects of the machine spilling over to his family, particularly his two young girls. living under her bed was watching her while she slept. While this was totally in the scope of your average seven-year-old's imagination, Anna did not sleep for days on end and began exhibiting violent 
outbursts of behavior. Eventually, her compromised state dictated that she had to be placed in a dark and room with her arms restrained. As any time she was exposed to bright lights, she felt the compulsion to scratch out her eyes, screaming that if she didn't take them out, the monster would be able to see her. Herman's journal becomes an almost illegible mess of scratch notes, random thoughts, and scribblings as exposure to the machine went on. A hieroglyph of one man's madness. One entry, if you can call it that, coldly recounts the tragedy that finally befell his family. His youngest daughter, Emily, aged four, frequently would go missing. Harmon's wife, Luca, would always find Emily standing transfixed in front of the machine. On the last occasion that Emily went missing, Luca snapped. She freed the restrained Anna from her cell, dragging her by her arms into the room where the machine was kept. There she encountered Emily, again standing vigil in a dazed state. Anna pulled free of Luca's grip, and before she could stop her, Anna had already clawed out both Emily's eyes and her own. Grief-stricken and falling prey to the hallucinogenic effects of the Harmon tone, Luca took a sharp piece of sheet metal to their throats before turning it on her own forearms, dragging them down their length, whereupon she bled to death, clutching her two eyeless children to her breast. Her face twisted into a mask of anguish and horror. the Harmon installation started to spread through the military sector. Secrecy was compromised due to the sheer number of soldiers who were inexplicably deemed MIA. Suspicions were aroused base-wide. Harmon had stopped keeping a journal and submitting weekly progress reports. The machine, despite its incredible potential, was a mistake. None of the generals responsible for its presence on American soil acknowledged any implication. Several resigned. One left a suicide note, declaring, I will not have this unholy vortex of terror on my conscience. sent to close down the installation, but Harmon was nowhere to be found. When the unit entered the facility, they found the machine still running, and all of the test subjects on record killed. Their bodies were found strapped to medical gurneys, their throats slashed. 
On the wall was a message scrawled in blood. Clean up your own mess. The sight, mixed with the hallucinogenic effects of the harm and tone, was too much for those good men to handle. After committing the entire detachment to a local mental hospital, we were under the impression that we could just let the dust settle and we could tuck this under the rug. Nice and neat. Recently, a group of college students found the facility and decided to use the building to house a party using the still functioning Deus Ex Machina as a lighting slash sound ring. I'm sure you can imagine the results. <laughs> Students died at the party from blood loss after clawing out their own eyes. The other partygoers panicked and left them in a cornfield where our reconnaissance retrieved them. The remaining witnesses to that incident have since been neutralized. went to destroy the machine, it was no longer on site. However, pictures of a man well into his 90s surfaced on surveillance cameras and convenience stores in the nearby town. He had been asking questions about the students' deaths. must be erased. Evidence buried. Witnesses terminated. Our hands must be washed of this once and for all. And may God have mercy on our souls.
So there it is, the top secret dossier of Dr. Cyrus Harmon. If you want to know more about Dr. Cyrus Harmon and his crazy machine, go to 7thStreetHaunt.com. This has been Scary Noises. Uh, We'll be back soon with stories and poems by Edgar Allan Poe. See you next time. Thank you for allowing Scary Noises to occupy your consciousness. Now go, warn the others, see what good it will do you! (laughs) 